Jeremiah, we're going to read the whole book. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. We won't read, we're not going to read the whole thing. Um, now, there's a lot that could be said about uh, Jeremiah. I, would, I was thinking about it as I was putting this message together. I thought to myself, man, it sure would be neat if Brother Walker did Jeremiah in one of the teen camps or family camps because you could get uh, quite a few messages out of the life of Jeremiah. So I'm going to give you some lessons from Jeremiah tonight. Now, if you've never read Jeremiah, Jeremiah has 52 chapters in it. And Jeremiah is one of what we call the major prophets. And he is right at the end of Israel before they get ready to go into captivity, or Judah before they get ready to go into captivity. So he's like the end. And the Lord, was, the Lord told Jeremiah that Israel was going to be in captivity for 70 years. Uh, Daniel, as a matter of fact, read the book of Jeremiah and found, figured that out, that, oh, it's going to be 70 years, but God didn't reveal that to him until two years before the captivity was over. And that shows you that, that even though it had been there for 68 years, Daniel never saw it. And they, imagine what is in this book that we haven't seen yet, and the Lord's still revealing things here as we get towards the end. Now, I'm just going to list a couple of the main characters that I'll mention tonight. And if you don't know, if you never read the book of Jeremiah, the purpose of me telling these stories is to whet your appetite so that you want to read uh, more of the scripture. So that's the purpose of it. Jeremiah, like I said, he's a, he's a prophet. He's called the weeping prophet. You'll notice that his, uh, when you begin to read the book of Jeremiah, he's very hard. Uh, he, when he preaches, it's hard preaching, and so it's, it's just negative, negative, negative. Uh, they hated him for it, uh, and they tried to kill him, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, the next fellow you need to know is a fellow by the name of Baruch, Baruch, B-A-R-U-C-H, Baruch. And Baruch, he's the son of Neriah. Baruch, he was kind of, uh, he teamed up with Jeremiah. Anytime that Jeremiah was uh, speaking scripture, Jeremiah, Baruch would be the one who wrote it down. And I'll show you that uh, in a little bit. The next fellow I want you to know is a fellow by the name of Abedmelech. I'll only mention him very briefly, Abedmelech the Ethiopian. And he's a, he's a eunuch who saves uh, Jeremiah's life. Jeremiah was thrown into like a dungeon-like setting where he's sinking down in a mire. And this guy goes to the king and says, hey, we got to save his life. And he does. And so the Lord, uh, Lord uses that uh, fellow to take care of Jeremiah. And the last fellow is a, is a guy named Sariah. Sariah is a quiet prince. S-E-R-I-A-H. He's called a quiet prince. And so for some of you, not all of you are outgoing. Some of you are quiet. Some of you are really, really quiet. Uh, but the Lord uses quiet people as well. I think sometimes we only think the Lord uses us loud mouths, uh, but the Lord uses everybody. And so that should be really encouraging for those of you that are quiet, that he used uh, Sariah, a quiet prince. Now I'm going to give you just a few things uh, here, but I want to show you what the spiritual temperature was like of Israel. Look at chapter 2, Jeremiah 2, verse 11. This is what the spiritual temperature was when Jeremiah was a prophet. Verse 11, 2, 11. Hath a nation changed their gods? So you take a nation, any nation. Uh, they usually don't change their gods. Whatever their gods are, that's their god. That's the god of this nation. That's the kind of how, how they are. Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? This is God talking about these nations. He says, but my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So what they, they do, they exchange the Lord for false gods. And he, the God likens himself to a uh, fountain of living waters, and he likens these false gods to cisterns, but not just cisterns, they're broken cisterns that can't hold any water. And that's what, these, uh, that's what Israel did. So they had, they, were, they had forsaken God, and in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 11, they're called backsliding Israel. They're also they're called backsliding in verse 12, backsliding in verse 14 as well. And they were, that's the condition. That's the spiritual condition that they were in. They had forsaken the Lord, and they are backsliding. That's the condition when Jeremiah shows up. <laughs> 
So imagine your audience is just a bunch of backslidden people who don't care anything about the message that you're going to preach or the God that you represent. And that's who God has commissioned you to go preach to. <laughs> that sounds like a very uh, wonderful ministry uh, there. He obviously doesn't build a big Sunday school. He doesn't have a bus ministry. He doesn't have a college. He doesn't have a church building. He doesn't even have anything. By the time it's all done, uh, this guy, uh, you could preach a message on how to be a failure in the ministry. <laughs> Uh, if you take today's uh, terminology of success, but Jeremiah was quite a success in God's eyes, even though he wasn't a success in man's eyes. So I have 45 points this evening. No, I'm just making sure you're paying attention. No, I have four things about Jeremiah that I think lessons we can learn. Number one, number one, here's what you're going to lesson we're going to learn from Jeremiah. Number one, Bible preaching is mainly negative. Bible preaching is mainly negative. Look at Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9 and verse 10. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have set thee this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, that's negative, and to pull down, that's negative, and to destroy, that's negative, and to throw down, that's negative, to build and to plant, there's the positive. <laughs> So uh, four out of the six are negative. That's 66.6 .6 repeating because I had to use a calculator <laughs> uh, to see that's the percentage of negativity that Jeremiah uh, gave. B uh, Bible preaching is negative. Yeah. Now that's seen because the Bible says in the last days men will not endure sound doctrine. Yeah endure sound doctrine. You want know to endure something is, that's to put up with it. Who wants to come to church and have 66% of the message just be negative and just a little bit of positive? Did you know the Bible tells a preacher to reprove, yep. rebuke, and exhort? <laughs> that's two-thirds negative. Reprove, that's telling you what you've done wrong. Rebuke, that's in your face. Knock it off and then exhort. Get a little bit of, you know, <laughs> encouragement there. <laughs> so, but we need that. You know what you have? Majority of preaching today, it's just all positive. So beware of all only positive preaching because it ain't from the Lord. And if it's from the Lord, who would it be from? Well, there's an old familiar friend that shows up in Genesis chapter 3. And he looks at Eve and the first word that comes out of his mouth is, Yay! Yea, had God said. Yea, that's positive. You know what the devil does? He has positive preaching. His ministers are positive. They're positive. They stand there before Ahab and they say, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper. You know what they were doing? They were lying. But they gave a positive message. I mean, can I ask you, do you re really, I mean, let's think about this logically. Do you really, do you really, are you, are you going to accept the message simply because the guy is positive when you know it's hurting you? It's like, it's like in the, what is that, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, eat this apple, you know. It's all nice, eat the apple, but it's, it harmed her. You know what a lot of people are doing these days? They're being given like, an, they're get, given an apple, eat this. It's in this, take this, it's wonderful, but it's harming them. It's harming them. All right, Bible preaching is mainly negative. All right, let me show you about this. Notice we have the fickleness of the people. Uh, I'm going to run through this quickly. Go to chapter 9, verses 2 and 3. The fickleness of the people, they are cowards for the truth. In uh, chapter 9, verses 2 and 3, oh that, I had, uh, oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging of wayfaring men, that I might leave my people. That's God talking. He wants to leave his people. And go from them, for they, for they be all adulterers and assembly of treacherous men. That's God talking about his people. And they bend their tongues like their bows for lies, and they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth. So notice they're not valiant for the truth. So the first thing about the fickleness of the people is they're cowards for the truth. And that is because they don't want it. Look at chapter 11 and verse 21. 11, 21. Therefore thus saith the Lord of the men of Anathoth, that's where uh, Jeremiah was preaching, that seek thy life, Jeremiah's life, saying, prophesy not in the name of the Lord, that thou die not by our hand. Imagine that. Imagine uh, God calls you fellas, God calls you to preach someplace, and the people say, don't tell us what God has to say. You better stop, because if you keep telling us what God has to say, we're going to kill you. We don't want to hear what God has to say. And these are God's people. <laughs> 
Oh, man, these are God's people, and that's what they're saying. All right, the fickleness of the people. Number one, they're cowards for the truth. Number two, they have a craving for lies. Craving for lies. Look at chapter 5. Chapter 5. How in the world could somebody have a craving for lies? Je uh, Jeremiah 5, verse 30. A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the people bear rule by their means, and my people love to have it so. And what will you do in the end thereof? The people like it. Tell me lies. Don't tell me the truth. Just tell me lies. That's a, the Bible says bread of deceit is sweet to a man, but afterwards his mouth shall be filled with gravel. So the fickleness of the people is they're cowards for the truth. They have cravings for the lies. And last of all, they have a concealing of their motives. Look over at chapter 42. Chapter 42 of Jeremiah. Now what ends up happening is uh, after... So, to back up just a second, when Jeremiah is preaching in Jerusalem, the Chaldeans have besieged the city about. And uh, Jeremiah keeps telling the king, just, look, this is God's judgment, submit to it. And the king says, I don't want to submit to it. Well, what ends up happening is the Chaldeans take over Jerusalem. And now, the people come to Jeremiah, and they ask Jeremiah, what should we do? Go ask the Lord what we should do. Jeremiah 42, verse 4. Then Jeremiah the prophet said unto them, I have heard you. Behold, I will pray unto the Lord your God according to your words, and it shall come to pass that whatsoever thing the Lord will answer you, I will declare it unto you. I will keep nothing back from you. Boy, that's great. Then they said unto, Jer said to Jeremiah, The Lord be a true and faithful witness between us if we do not even according to all things for the which the Lord thy God has sent thee to us. Man, Jeremiah hears that and he jumps on band and he says, Church, you're not going to believe what I heard. I gave the preaching and they told me they wanted to hear from the Lord. <laughs> I could you imagine that? Man, that would be a blessing if, you, if somebody told you that. But they're lying. They're lying. Jeremiah goes away and he prays for about 10 days and he gets the message. And then he comes back to him and he delivers the message. But in verse 19 of this chapter, he says this, The Lord has said concerning you, O ye remnant of Judah, go ye not into Egypt. They wanted to go to Egypt. And he says, don't go there. He says, know certainly that I have admonished you this day, for ye dissembled in your hearts. Now, dissemble, the dictionary definition of dissemble means to be hypocritical, to assume a false appearance, to conceal the real facts or motives. So when they came to Jeremiah and they asked Jeremiah, tell us what the Lord wants, they were really dissembling. They, were, they didn't really want to know. They really concealed their motives. You know what this is like? This is like somebody who comes and says, tell me what I'm supposed to do, but they really don't want to know what they're supposed to do from the Bible. They just are hoping that you will confirm what they're already going to do. Does that make sense? That's what they wanted to do for Jeremiah. And Jeremiah gave them the word of the Lord, but it didn't go along with what they wanted. Notice in chapter 43, verses 1 and 2. And it came to pass that when Jeremiah made an end of speaking all the words unto all the people, all the words of the Lord their God, for which the Lord their God had sent unto him even all these words, then spake Azariah, the son of Hoshiah, the son of Johanan, the son of Kareah, and all the proud men saying unto Jeremiah, Thou speakest falsely, the Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt, sojourn there. Notice what stopped them from hearing the truth was their pride. And the reason why they said Jeremiah didn't say what God told him to say is because it didn't line up with what they wanted to do. You've got to be real careful with what, when what you want to do and what God's word, when they clash, you better submit to God's word. But what doesn't let you submit to God's word is your pride. And that's what happens here. All right, look at uh, chapter 44. Chapter 44. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, chapter 42, verse... Nope, 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 nope. No, you're, I'm, I'm right. 44, verse 3 and verse 4. He says, because of their wickedness, this is in the same uh, uh, time frame as of, of what we just uh, said here. I'm just speeding through it. It says, because of their wickedness, which they have committed uh, to provoke me to anger, and that they went to burn incense to serve other gods whom they knew not, neither they, ye, nor your fathers. Howbeit I sent you unto all my servant, I sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, saying, Oh, do not this abominable thing that I hate. 
God had been sending his prophets to Israel telling them, knock it off. Quit serving these other gods. But I'll tell you why they didn't accept Jeremiah's preaching. Because Jeremiah's preaching hit their pet sin. That's why they didn't accept it. Notice in the same ver chapter, verse 15 and verse 16. Remember, they had been burning incense to other gods. Verse 15, then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods and all the women that stood by a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt in Pathros, answered Jeremiah saying, as for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. Wow, you told us what God said, and we are not going to do it. Now, we would never do that here. We would never say it, at least out loud. <laughs> There's an old song called, uh, in the hymnal called, I Shall Not Be Moved. Well, a preacher uh, uh, took that and kind of changed the, the words to it, and it went something like this. It goes, uh, it goes, the preacher preached and hollered all the evening long. He preaches on my fun, and then he says it's wrong. I'll just go home and call him narrow-minded, for I shall not be moved. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're not like that. When the Holy Spirit convicts your heart, how do you respond to it? Do you say, well, that's just the preacher's opinion. Oh, I'm not going to do that. Do you know, why, you know why these, what these men did? These men answered Jeremiah... Jeremiah was preaching about them sacrificing their false gods. You know why these men spoke up? Because mama was standing over there looking at them. Because the women had been doing it too. They'd been sacrificing, but they also, the, the men were not innocent. They'd been in on it. If you read later on in the chapter, they'd been doing it. But here are these fellas, over, uh, these women, they're standing over here, you know, and they're, they're watching this thing, and Jeremiah starts preaching on their, their secret sins. And all of a sudden, they start crossing the arms, and they start looking, or they start going, <sighs> pretending like, you know, you know how it is. You know, uh, I'm going to pretend like this doesn't get to me, and you know, I'm not, I'm not going to let the preacher know that he's, that he's hitting me. And all about that time, you know, they're, 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 they're doing this. They're looking at their, honey, uh, their husband like that, kind of looking at him. And the husband's over here, and he's feeling the daggers. <laughs> now he's got to say something. <laughs> <laughs> Now, now I, I, I've, heard, I, I have, I've had other preacher friends tell me <laughs> that sometimes they would have some, a man come to them to tell them a problem that the man had with him, and that was the reason why they were leaving the church. Mm -hmm. But come to find out, it actually was the wife that actually had the problem. <laughs> it, was a, it was a preacher friend of mine told me that. It was, you know, he told me that kind of stuff happens in other places. Yeah. Brother Adam, I'm just telling you this. This is what I heard has happened before. <laughs> You know what was happening. I uh, was happening. She's looking at him. You're going to say something, right? Ladies, I'd like to tell you something, give you a word of encouragement. Hey, do you, do you see the influence you can have in your home? You can have an influence in your home for good, or you can have an influence in your home for bad. How do you use your influence in a home? Now, what happened was the preaching went out. They didn't like it. And so hubby had to stand up and say something. <laughs> All right, now the fickleness of the people. They were cowards for the truth. They had cravings for lies, and they concealed their motives. You have the fickleness of the people. You have the fearfulness of the potentate. <laughs> trying to use all P's here. <laughs> fearfulness of the potentate. Look at chapter 38. Chapter 38. So Bible preaching is negative. People didn't like it. The people didn't like it. The king didn't like it. That's the potentate. Chapter 38 of Jeremiah, verse 19 and verse 20. This is Zedekiah. Zedekiah the king said unto Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Jews that are fallen to the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me into their hand, and they mock me. But Jeremiah said, They will not deliver thee. Obey, I beseech thee, the voice of the Lord, which I speak unto thee, so it shall be well with thee, and thy soul shall live. Uh, you know why Zedekiah didn't want to obey the word of the Lord? Because he was afraid of what people thought. The fear of man bringeth a snare. He was afraid of people. If he had feared the Lord, he wouldn't have feared the people. But what kept him from obeying God was a fear of the people. Notice there's a fraudulence in the pulpit. Look at chapter 14. Chapter 14. Preaching of the Bible preaching is negative. Uh, Jeremiah 14, but the false prophets weren't preaching a negative message. 
Uh, Jeremiah 14, verses 14 and 15. Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither speak unto them. They prophesy unto a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. Think about that. These guys are not even preaching God's word at all. They're just preaching from their own heart. And it's the deceit of their own heart. You got to watch out for that. Watch out for that. But last of all, notice the faithfulness of the prophet in Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah is our prophet in Jeremiah chapter 23. Notice verse 28. Jeremiah 23, 28. The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. Jeremiah was a faithful prophet. Now, why did he keep preaching? Well, he kept preaching because of the possibilities. Look in Luke, uh, I'm sorry, not Luke, but Jeremiah 36. Jeremiah 36. Jeremiah 36 and verse 7. Notice he tells, uh, he tells uh, Baruch to go and read this, this, uh, this book of the law, to read what Jeremiah had wrote. And in verse 7 it says, It may be they will present their supplication before the Lord and will return every one from his evil way. Jeremiah says, let's just keep on preaching because it may be that these people may get right. You know why Jeremiah kept preaching? Oh, I was faithful because the possibilities. Can I encourage a Christian? Don't quit witnessing. Don't quit telling people about Jesus Christ. Why? The possibilities. There's somebody out there who might want to get saved. There's somebody out there who might want the good news. I mean, not all of them do. Uh, granted, there are some people that will just tear up the, I've had them tear up tracks and throw them in my face. I had them slam doors in my face. I, I had them take a track, burn a track right there in front of me. I had them th throw cigarettes at me, scream at me, holler at me. I mean, yeah, you get those reactions, but don't stop because I've also had those people who said, yes, I want to know about that. <laughs> And I've seen them kneel down on the ground and get saved, or I've seen them there in their car and get saved, or on the street corner out their door. I've seen them get saved. Don't quit. Why? The possibilities. The possibilities. So don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged. Our job is not to win them. Our job is to warn them. And you know, uh, it's like you go fishing. You go fishing, and every once in a while you catch something. He kept preaching because of the possibilities. He kept preaching because of the pride. Look at chapter 13. Chapter 13, he kept preaching because of the pride. Chapter 13, now if you scan verses 1 down to verse 11, you'll notice this is the famous uh, story about the girdle. Now if I recollect correctly, a girdle is like an undergarment that's worn to kind of suck in the fat. Am I right about that? Amen. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> and so it just kind of makes you look better. Well, Jeremiah was told, <laughs> I, I, that's what it is, right? It, uh, okay. Uh, didn't they used to use those back in like the, the Victorian age? And some, if I recollect, some women had to have their ribs removed. So that way they could just tighten it up, you know, and they, they had problems with the intestines and everything. Oh, corset. Okay, so I wrong, wrong thing. <laughs> All right. So anyway, Jeremiah has to take this girdle, and he puts this girdle on, and then he has to go take it down and bury it. This is weird stuff, man. <laughs> but I'm glad the Lord doesn't have us do this kind of stuff today, you know. And he said, now go bury this uh, girdle down there by the river. And so he goes, and he buries it down by the river. And he says, after a few days, he said, go back and get it. <laughs> so he goes back and gets it, and he pulls that girdle out, and that girdle is all nasty and everything. And he says, look, I'm going to mar the pride of Israel. Now, when I think that's in verse 9. talks about their pride. Now that girdle, they will wear that girdle to make themselves look better. You know what your pride is all about? It's all about how well you look, how good you look. But when they rejected God's word, God said, I'm going to mar their pride. You know what he did? He then takes them. They get ca taken captive by the Chaldeans. When, they, when, the, when, uh, when finally they, the, the, the Babylonians come in and attack, they're hanging people up by their thumbs. They're killing people in the streets. They're taking kids and dashing them up against uh, uh, the stones. You know what he said? I'm going to mar your pride. You've got to be careful. When pride gets in between you and obeying God's word, God knows how to go after your pride and bring your pride down. The Bible says God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. He keeps preaching because of the pride. Somebody needs to preach. Somebody needs to stand up there. Somebody needs to give the word of God. Somebody needs to do it. Will you do it? 
Uh, he keeps preaching because of the pressure, because of the pressure. And this is an internal pressure, not an external pressure. Look at chapter 20. Chapter 20. This is like my favorite verse in all of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 20. Watch how Jeremiah talks to God in verse 7. O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. <laughs> what a way to talk to God. <laughs> You deceived me, God. <laughs> That's the way he talks to the Lord. He tells God, I'm done. I quit. I quit. But then in verse 9, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. Jeremiah quits the ministry, but notice the pressure. Ver uh, middle of verse 9, But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire, shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. <laughs> the problem with Jeremiah is he had so much of the word of God in him that when he quit, he couldn't quit. <laughs> it's just the pressure. Some of you know what it is. You've tried not to say anything at your job. I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. And then all of a sudden, somebody says something, and all, mm, mm, it just out it comes. <laughs> you say, I'm not going to say anything, but then you just have to say something. <laughs> all right, the pressure. He had to keep preaching. So the Bible preaching is mainly negative. And when it comes to negative preaching, you see the people don't like it. You see that uh, the king didn't like it. And the false prophets didn't like it, but thank God for a faithful prophet. Now, the second lesson we learn is that God takes care of his man. Look at chapter 9. God takes care of his man. Uh, chapter 9 and verse 23. Chapter 9 and verse 23. God will take care of his man. Verse 23 and verse 24. It says, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, nor let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things do I delight, saith the Lord. You know, Jeremiah was not a rich man. Jeremiah didn't have a lot of connections. Jeremiah didn't have a lot of strength. He didn't have an army backing him. But what he did have is he had the Lord. And the Lord says to you and I, uh, don't glory in all the physical stuff. You, if you want to glory in something, glory that you know the Lord. Amen. You know, they say it's not what you know, it's, it's who you know. <laughs> well, let me tell you who I know. <laughs> all right, God takes care of his man. God takes care of his man in discouragement. If you quick, turn quickly to chapter 20. Notice verse 10 and 11. In verse 10 and 11, you find that they were defaming old Jeremiah. They were saying things about him, and they were hoping that Jeremiah would fail. They were hoping he would fail so they could say something about him. Could you imagine that? Uh, if the people you're trying to help are just waiting for you to stumble and fall, find some type of character defect with you or something, go say, aha, I knew he wasn't the kind of Christian that we thought him to be. That's what they're doing about old Jeremiah. That got discouraging after a while. But you know what the Lord did? The Lord helped Jeremiah through it. Uh, the, the God takes care of his man in discouragement. God takes care of his man in death. In uh, chapter 26 of Jeremiah, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but in chapter 26, they had taken Jeremiah and they had put him down in the dungeon. This is where I had talked to you about it before. They put him down in the dungeon and uh, he was, they left him down there to die. But old abed like the Ethiopian, he got some rags and, and tied them together and got about 30 men and went over there and saved him and rescued him out of that thing and took care of him. Jeremiah thought he was going to lose his life. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, if God wants you dead, you're going to die. But if the Lord doesn't want you dead, you just keep going on and being bold for him. And what he tells you to do, just do it. So he took care of them in death. He also took care of them in the dungeons, in the dungeons. And that actually was chapter 38 with Abedmelech. In chapter 26, the people wanted to kill him uh, because he had, uh, I, I got my stories backwards. In chapter 26, the people wanted to kill him because of what he said. And when the religious people brought up, uh, hey, we got to kill this guy, you know who saved his life? The secular people did. The religious people wanted him dead. But it was the guys that weren't religious, they're the ones that stood up for them. You know what you're going to find? Some of you are going to find on the job site, you're going to find that some of the guys that are going to cause you the biggest problems are backslidden Christians. <laughs> and some of the lost people are going to be some of your allies. <laughs> uh, but it's the Christians that are going to give you a hard time. And then last of all, he took care of his man in dispersion. 
So what happens is at the end of uh, the story, Jeremiah, uh, they, they tell Jer Jeremiah says, don't go down into Egypt. And they say, we're going down into Egypt anyway, and we're taking you with us. <laughs> Well, down he goes down into Egypt, and don't you know he was protesting the whole entire way? Couldn't you imagine that? I'm at, they, somebody probably got sick of Jeremiah along the way. <laughs> He's probably preaching the whole way down there, you know, repent, repent, you know. <laughs> Shut that preacher up. <laughs> he gets down there into Egypt. You know what he does? He keeps preaching right down there in Egypt. And uh, you know what the Lord does? The Lord takes care of his man. The Lord takes care of his man. The Lord will take care of you. We sing the song, Be not dismayed, whatever be tied. God will take care of you. So we learn that God takes care of his man. Now this is very relevant to today. Because if you look at the temperature of the United States, I move we are that close to having either a civil war or that close to having our nation overrun. I mean, they're talking about all sorts of things, whether it's uh, 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 people that are planted in the country that are going to rise up in arms and attack, or you're going to have outside threats, or North Korea is going to shoot over a missile, or all of a sudden everybody's going to start shooting each other in a civil war. You have no idea what's going to happen. I just know this, is that I feel that uh, we are running on fumes when it comes to the mercy of God. God has been very merciful to this country, and I thank the Lord for it. I don't want this country to go down. <laughs> I think that's dumb if you want the country to go down. <laughs> Aren't you in it? <laughs> Don't you have children and family in this country? Why would you want the country to go down? <laughs> now, I pray the Lord makes our military super strong. <laughs> I pray all our weapons work and that we stay on Israel's side. <laughs> and that when our guys shoot, they shoot straight. <laughs> a bullet lands where it's supposed to land. I mean, uh, I don't want our country to go down. Uh, but I'll tell you what, if it does go down, it, we kind of deserve it. You say, why? Have you checked the sin in our country lately? You checked how many unborn babies have been murdered in our country and all the, 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 the crime that takes place and the forsaking of God and the new versions. I'm t we have kicked God out all over the place. I mean, for crying out loud, most, uh, most Christians don't even want Him anymore in their daily devotions. So, you know what? Thank God for His mercy. Now, uh, you take Jeremiah. Jeremiah comes down. It comes down to the end and his nation is wiped out because of the judgment of God. But God took care of his man. The lesson is this. If the judgment of God falls on this nation, and if everything is just going south like they say it is, your biggest asset is not how many weapons you have or friends you have or the militia you're a part of. The best asset that you have is God Almighty. Yeah. So what you need to do is if you are not right with God, you need to get right with God. If you don't have a prayer life, get one. If you're not in the book, start getting in the book. Get as close to God as you possibly can because when the bullets are flying, he's the one that you're going to need. God takes care of his man. That's the second lesson that we learn. The third lesson that we learn is God places a high value on obedience. God places a high value on obedience. In Jeremiah 35, Jeremiah brings in a bunch of people. They are, uh, I believe they're called uh, uh, Rechabites or something along those lines. And he brings in these fellas and he has all this, uh, all this wine laid out before him. And it's, uh, I don't, it's most likely new wine. You guys know that from the lesson we had the other day on it. And he lays it out before him and he says, I want you to drink uh, of this. And they looked at him and they said, we can't drink because Jonadab, our father, said we're not supposed to do that. And we're not even supposed to uh, have property here. That's why we dwell in tents. We are strangers in your land. And we are obeying the voice of our father. And he uses that word, our father. And I thought, man, what a slap in the face that was to the Jewish people. Because you know who God was? Matthew chapter 6, our father. That's who he was. And these, these people used a term that the Jewish people could use about their God, but they would obey their earthly father and Israel would not obey their heavenly father. God puts a high price on obedience. But notice, nobody's obeying the Lord. Notice the state of the pastors in chapter 10. Chapter 10 of Jeremiah in verse 21. Chapter 10 in verse 21. For the pastors are become brutish and have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they shall not prosper and all their flocks shall be scattered. So the pastors are not obeying the Lord. Notice the people are not obeying the Lord. Chapter 8 and verse 12. Chapter 8 and verse 12. 
Were they, uh, were they ashamed when they had committed an abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. These people got to the point where they couldn't even blush anymore over sin. Have you lost your blush? Do you know, you know what I mean by that? Like if you turn red because somebody tells a dirty joke, or you turn red because of some, something sinful, does that happen to you? Have you lost your blush? You know what, Israel, they could, sin didn't bother them anymore. It was just one big joke to them. They couldn't even blush about it anymore. How about your own sin? Does it bother you? Does it bother you when you get before the Lord and the Lord starts to reveal a sin in your life? Does it bother you anymore? Remember when it used to? Remember when your heart was tender towards the Lord and sin bothered you? Have you lost that? All right, the, the people, the state of the people was disobedience. What's the solution to the problem? Chapter 10, chapter 10, verses 23 through 24. O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. O oh Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. You know what my prayer is? Lord, I don't even have it in me to know what I'm supposed to do. I need you to correct me. I need you to show me what I'm supposed to do. All right, last of all, the last lesson that I want to point out from the book of Jeremiah. Uh, first of all, Bible preaching is mainly negative. Number two, God takes care of his man. Number three, God places a high value on obedience. But number four, God does not place a high value on the originals. Let me show you what I mean. Look at chapter 36, Jeremiah 36. Jeremiah 36, verses 1 through verse 4. Now, I'm going to go for sake of time, so write this down. I trust, I trust that you're going to read this later. Jeremiah 36, 1 through 4. Jeremiah gets a roll of a book, and he writes something. And when he writes this stuff, he tells Baruch to go read it. Baruch goes and reads it, and in verse... Notice in verse uh, 17, and they, these are the people he read it to, the princes he read it to, asked Baruch, saying, tell us, how didst thou write all these words at his mouth? Now, notice the mysterious way that he wrote these words. Then Baruch answered them, he pronounced all these words unto me with his mouth, and I wrote them with ink in the book. <laughs> Everybody thinks so mysterious. That mysterious. He just told me what to write, and I wrote it down. <laughs> All right, so now what ends up happening? They tell Baruch, they say, listen, you and Jeremiah go hide yourself. These, these words are scary. They were afraid of what they heard. They, we're going to go read these words of the king. So they go and they read them to the king. Now, at the time they read them to the king, it was winter, and there was a hearth there in front of everybody. And they began to read, they call them leaves. They began to read from the leaves these, these uh, pages of the book. Notice in verse 22. Now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month, and there was a fire in the hearth burning before him. And it came to pass that when Jehudi had read three or four leaves, he cut it with a penknife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Imagine, ladies and gentlemen, just for a moment. Look up here. I have my Bible. Imagine for just a second that I were to take and <laughs> rip it out. I made you look. <laughs> Did your heart jump? Yeah. <laughs> How many of you are like, oh, oh, man? <laughs> Do you want to know what their reaction was? Look at verse 24. Yet they were not afraid, nor rent their garments, neither the king nor any of his servants that heard all these words. No big deal. Now, you know what just happened? The original that had just been written was now burned in the fire. Original number one is burned. Notice in verse 27, Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after that the king had burned the roll, and the words uh, which uh, Baruch wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah, saying, Take thee again another roll, <laughs> and write in it all the former words that were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, had burned. So now we've got uh, original number two, but original number two is actually better than original number one, 
Because if you look in verse 32, then Jeremiah took another roll and gave it to Baruch, the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire, and there were added besides unto them many like words. So original number one is burned up, and God has him write original number two, but adds words into original number two. You say, why in the world would God do that? Because he's God, and he can do whatever he wants to do. So now what happens to original number two? Now why are we doing this? Because in scholarship today, if you go to Jeremiah chapter 51, Jeremiah 51, in scholarship today, there is a high premium put on the originals. They'll say this, we believe, you start noticing this when you read the statements of faith of different churches. So if you're trying to look for a church, and in the statement of faith about the Word of God, if they say, we believe the Bible to be the Word of God, and that's the end of it, you need to ask, what Bible? You also need to know when they say, we believe the Bible is inspired in the original languages. Nobody has them. <laughs> we already saw that original one got burned up. <laughs> so they're out. Well, at least we have original number two. <laughs> Or do we? <laughs> Original number two. Notice what happens. So a bunch of stuff gets added in, and I'll let you, you can read this in your own uh, reading. But basically what gets added is a bunch of the stuff that you already uh, have read up to chapter 51. And now Jeremiah takes that role and he gives it to, remember Sariah, the quiet, the quiet prince? That's this guy. Verse 59. The word which Jeremiah the prophet commanded Sariah the son of Neriah, the son of Maaseah, when he went with Zedekiah the king of Judah into Babylon in the fourth year of his reign, and this Sariah was a quiet prince. So Jeremiah wrote in a book all the evil that should come upon Babylon, even all these words that are written against Babylon. And Jeremiah said to Sariah, When thou comest to Babylon, and shalt see, and shalt read all these words, then shalt thou say, O Lord, thou hast spoken against this place to cut it off, that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, but it shall be desolate forever. Now at the time Sariah gets this writing, he goes into Babylon. God says he's going to destroy Babylon, but Babylon is at its height. I mean, this is when Nebuchadnezzar is a world ruler. But God said... He's going to bring them down. And if God says something, it doesn't matter how much power you have, the words of God cannot be overthrown. So he says, Jer Sar Sariah, when you get there and you read these words, you know you look around you, you see Babylon in the height of its power, God's bringing them down. You need to know that. Now verse 63. And it shall be when thou hast made an end of reading this book, that thou shalt bind a stone to it, and cast it into the midst of Euphrates, and thou shalt say, Thus shall Babylon sink, and shall not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. Thus far the words of, Jer uh, and, uh, thus far the words of Jeremiah. So, Sariah, you understand what he had to do? He had to take that book, tie it up, and chuck it into the river. Well, there goes original number two. <laughs> Down into the river. <laughs> But I have a quick question for you. Do you have a book in your Bible called Jeremiah? <laughs> but I thought the original got thrown into the, the water. <laughs> then how in the world do you have it? Because you've got a copy of that original. Do you understand? So these people that are putting a big premium on the originals, God doesn't put a big premium on the originals. He's just concerned about His words. That's what he's concerned about. You know what that copy is? That copy is Scripture. Because Timothy, one day Paul told Timothy, he says, that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, plural. There is no way that Timothy had all the originals. You even see that right there. If he had the book of Jeremiah, there's no way he had any of the originals. He had copies of them, though. So the copies were Scripture. Because God is concerned about getting his word. That's what he's preserving. Amen. Not the document. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. If you study church history, you see how they burned Bibles. They tortured people who had Bibles. And yet we still have it here today. Yeah. So I guess now the question comes, can a translation be scripture? Have you not read the New Testament? Don't you see how many Old Testament quotations there are? 
in the New Testament. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew. New Testament is written in Greek. And in order for them to take that Old Testament quotation in Hebrew, they had to translate it into Greek. So yes, a translation can be scripture. You say, can I get the scripture? <laughs> if you have yourself a King James 1611 Bible, you don't need to go find in the originals because you're not going to find them. <laughs> you just need to get yourself that book right there. You can hold the scriptures in your hand, God's perfect word. So four lessons we learn from Jeremiah. One, Bible preaching is mainly negative. Number two, God takes care of his man. Number three, God places a high value on obedience. And number four, God does not place a high value on the originals. So you have, if you have a King James Bible, you have the word of God, the words of God. So my friend, preach the word. All right, let's all stand. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to talk about Jeremiah tonight. And Lord, the folks have been very uh, patient and they've been attentive. And I know that they have been tired from a long day of work. But Lord, they came to church not for the preacher. They came for you. Amen. And so Father, I pray that if you gave them something tonight from your book, that they would deal with you about that particular uh, topic, Lord. Uh, Father, maybe some have been obedient or maybe they kind of uh, got a little cold in their Christian life. But Father, I pray you charge them up and help them as they finish out their week. Father, help us to keep preaching the gospel message, if anything, for the possibility that somebody might get saved. And Lord, if we ever feel like quitting, may we have so much of the Word of God in us that we can't quit because it's in us. Father, we love you. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, I